Good morning. My name is Melissa Long, and I'm a second year MPH student in the Department of Health Behavior. And my name is Shakira Thomas, and I'm a first year doctoral student also in the Department of Health Behavior. And we are the co-chairs for the 39th Annual Minority Health Conference. On behalf of the Minority Student Caucus, we welcome each and every one of you here. The, Mi the Minority Health Conference has been held since 1977, growing each year since its, in since its inception. This event has become the largest and longest running student-led health conference in the nation, devoted to bringing minority health issues to the forefront of public health discourse, research, and practice. Today, we are honored to be a part of this tradition, and we are excited to celebrate the 39th anniversary of the conference with you all. The theme for this year's conference is Reclaiming the Narrative. Narratives are the foundation of how we make sense of the world and of who we believe ourselves and others to be. It is important to understand that narratives can beneficially or harmfully impact our behaviors. However, narratives don't exist in a binary. And recognizing their dynamic nature is crucial, particularly considering the communities we work in partnership with. Policies and practices regarding issues such as DACA, police brutality, immigration, and poverty are reflective of narratives that disempower and dehumanize minority communities. In spite of these tensions, we are inspired by those who step up and speak truth to power. This conference attracts individuals from various personal and professional backgrounds, interests, political ideologies, and identities. Our vision for this conference is to highlight and celebrate the uniqueness of marginalized communities, and our hope is that attendees will engage in cross-learning and dialogue as we all recognize our roles in this common goal. When we organize and unify around the shared vision of creating lasting, equitable change for all, we are truly able to create something powerful. Today, we challenge you to attend breakout sessions and view posters to learn about topics you know little about. Connect with the exhibitors, colleagues, and community members who have passions that differ from yours, and commit to expanding your view of the world to welcome in others. Think about the narratives that are perpetuated about the communities you identify with, and reflect on how they've impacted various aspects of your life. View narratives as both a force that transcends racial, sexual, gender, and other identities, and as a thread that ties us together. In an effort to ensure all feel welcome, we wanted everyone to be made aware of two single occupancy restrooms that have been designated gender neutral, located upstairs in the Friday Center. Finally, we would like to thank each of you for your support and attendance today. Your passion for and commitment to health equity is a chief factor in the success and sustainability of this conference. We hope that you will take what you learned today and apply it to your own personal and professional endeavors and take pride in being intentional about reclaiming the narrative. We would like to take the time to thank and recognize the commitment of our planning committee members who have worked to execute the vision of this year's conference. Thank you to the conference co-chairs and committee members who made the student-led conference possible. Please stand so that we can recognize you for your commitment. <laughs> Special acknowledgement also goes to our tireless and persistent planning coordinator, Shanae James, a second year MPH student in health behavior. Shanae, please stand so we can also recognize you. As a student-led endeavor, we have often relied on the support and guidance from faculty and staff at the Gilling School of Global Public Health. We are extremely thankful and deeply appreciative of the Minority Health Conference faculty and staff advisors. Charlita Sim Evans, Trinette Cooper, Trandra Codwell, Cheryl Whitfield, Victor Schumbach, Ava Maynard, OJ McGee, and Sterling Frierson. We also thank Dean Barbara Reimer, Angelica Figueroa, and Elizabeth French for their ongoing support. Becky Hart and Kathy Cheek at the North Carolina Institute 
for public health were also crucial in our success. Their continued support and guidance has been instrumental throughout the planning process. Many thanks to the Friday Center who have supported us and our conference over the years. We will not be standing here without the trailblazers who came before us. Dr. John W. Hatch, one of the founders of the Minority Student Caucus, and Dr. Jeannie Ang, one of the founders of the Minority Health Conference. Thank you for being pioneers in your time and working to create a conference that would grow from a one-room gathering to the, an event of this magnitude 39 years later. This conference would not have been possible without your continued support through all these years. Please join us in applauding Drs. Hatch and Ang, as well as our special guests. We have several virtual attendees joining us today for the William T. Small Jr. keynote lecture via webcast. This foundational talk is named after Dean Small, who was a key supporter and advisor to the Minority Student Caucus and Conference for over 25 years. The William T. Small Jr. keynote lecture, now in its 20th year, is an invigorating and galvanizing highlight of our conference. Thus, we would like to extend a special welcome to our partner conferences and group viewings presented by student and community groups across the country. Today, we welcome the following partner conferences. The School of Public Health at the University of Illinois at Chicago, the Center for Social Justice, Human and Civil Rights at the University of Georgia, the Center for the Study of Racism, Social Justice and Health at the UCLA Fielding School of Public Health, the School of Public Health at Brown University, and the Improving Community Outcomes for Maternal and Child Health Collaborative at the Mecklenburg and Union County Departments of Health. Thank you to all the partner conferences and group viewings who have elected to participate in critical conversations about health equity and justice for us all. Additionally, we'd also like to thank all of our generous sponsors who have made this conference possible. We would especially like to thank the Dean's Office at the UNC Gillings School of Global Public Health for their strong support in making the conference sustainable over the years. We are truly appreciative. This afternoon, we will be celebrating the seventh annual Victor J. Schumbach Health Disparities Lecture. Dr. Schumbach has been a part of the conference for many years and has dedicated his career to advancing the concerns of minority students and the cause of health equity at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. We are sad that Dr. Schumbach will be retiring and as a result will be stepping down as an advisor to the Minority Health Conference and the Minority Student Caucus. Dr. Schumbach is one of our strongest advocates and most well-known representatives. He's always ready to promote and support the Minority Health Conference. Working with him has been an unforgettable experience. Dr. Schumbach, you have been such an enthusiastic historian of the Minority Health Conference and the Minority Student Caucus. We hope that our gift embodies your dedication to preserving the efforts of minority students, faculty, and staff here at Gillings over the years. Thank you. We'd like to present Dr. Schumbach with a token of our appreciation. Dr. Schumbach, can you please come up so that we may honor you? We now have the honor of introducing the Minority Student Caucus co-presidents, Samuel Baxter and Caitlin Williams. It has been wonderful working with Samuel and Caitlin this year in organizing the conference, and they will now be providing a few remarks. Good morning, everyone. My name is Samuel Baxter. I am a doctoral student in the Department of Health Policy and Management at Gillen School of Global Public Health, and I am serving as a co-president for the Minority Student Caucus this academic year. Good morning, Anyong Iseo, y bienvenidos a todas, todos, y todes. My name is Caitlin Williams. I'm a doctoral student in the Department of Maternal and Child Health, and I am also serving with Samuel as one of the co-presidents of the Minority Student Caucus this year. On behalf of the entire Minority Student Caucus and its membership, 
we are honored to continue the tradition of joining with the Minority Health Conference presentees, presenters and attendees to reclaim the narrative around health and health disparities. It is a privilege to stand here as representatives of our fellow caucus members and all of the students who have worked together tirelessly the past year to put this conference together. In 1971, a group of black students gathered at John Hatch's living room and decided to form a black student caucus to press for increased enrollment of minority students and gather attention to minority health issues in their curriculums. The group issued a statement of these concerns, which was then presented to Dean, Main, Dean Mays. In 1976, the caucus changed its name to the Minority Student Caucus to include American Indian, Asian Pacific Islander, and Desi American, and Latinx American students. Now, 47 years into its existence, the caucus has expanded its focus to fostering a safe and civil environment for all students here at Gillings. The caucus's annual Minority Health Conference began in 1977 as a small gathering in Rosenau Auditorium whose purpose was to provide a platform to highlight issues of concern for people of color, attract students to our school, and provide a forum for scholarly exchange of ideas related to understanding and addressing health disparities. Though the nature of some of these concerns may have changed, the Minority Health Conference continues to carry on the work first started by the caucus and the students, staff, and faculty who preceded us. We would like to take a moment to acknowledge any Minority Student Caucus and Minority Health Conference alumni who are here today. So if you're an alum in either the Minority Student Caucus or the conference, we invite you to now stand or wave as you are able so that we can acknowledge you. We would also like to thank our fearless and thoughtful advisors and mentors who have supported and guided this effort. Finally, we would like to thank all of you who continue to support the Minority Health Conference year after year. Your commitment to eliminating health disparities is what helps keep this community thriving. The theme for our 39th conference empowers us to organize and tell our stories. In this vein, yesterday's pre-conference event an evening with Byron Hurt showcased the award-winning filmmaker's recent documentary, Soul Food Junkies, which illuminated the historical and culinary journey of soul food. We hope your attendance today will inspire you to analyze the narratives you receive or produce, and also make room for the storytellers and truth-tellers in your spheres of influence. It is now our pleasure to introduce Barbara K. Reimer, DRPH, Dean and Alumni Distinguished Professor of the UNC Gillings School of Global Public Health at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. She is the author of over 265 peer-reviewed publications and has received numerous awards, including the American Cancer Society's Medal of Honor and Director's Award from the NIH. Dr. Reimer was elected to the Institute of Medicine in 2008 and appointed by President Obama to chair the President's Cancer Panel in 2011. Please join us in welcoming Dean Reimer. Good morning. It's my privilege to welcome you to the largest and longest running student-led health conference in the country, the 39th Annual Minority Health Conference. So I want to start out with a few safety tips, which we're going to be adding for all conferences. Think of these as the safety tips for the beginning of a plane takeoff, except I'd like you to listen. Uh, <laughs> once again, we were shocked and saddened um, last week by the news of the, um, of the mass shootings at, um, in, at Park, in Parkland. And um, we're very aware of concerns on campuses across the country, including this conferences. So I just want to remind you that emergencies come in many forms, weather, medical, fire, um, and people intent on harm. We, it is very unlikely that there would be anything happening here today, but we just want to make people, everybody aware that it's all of our responsibility to think about prevention. So if there were to be an emergency here, Friday Center staff would inform attendees through the public address system and conference staff um, assigned to direct people 
to, um, to safe areas. Depending on the threat, those areas might be um, um, evacuation from the building or sheltering in place in the building. Sheltering in place rooms are the Grumman Auditorium, where we are right now, Dogwood, Redbud, Redbud, and um, boardrooms. If, if you see anything that makes you concerned today, um, Cheryl Whitfield, um, um, a variety of conference staff and Friday Center, um, center staff should be told. Don't hesitate if you see something that makes you nervous. Um, so now I get to the fun part, which is, um, which is adding thank yous to those that have already been said. And I want to point out um, Samuel Baxter and Caitlin Williams, co-chairs who you just heard from. You've done a fabulous job. And Melissa Long and Shakira Thomas, um, you have been amazing. Um, leading this conference is a huge effort and an awesome responsibility, and you have done a fabulous job. Every year, we are amazed by the way in which a student planning committee turns into a remarkable conference machine and stamps their own unique brand on this annual event that has survived and thrived and evolved for many years. This year's group has been truly exceptional. And I think back to my early days as a dean when I used to worry if anybody would show up here. I don't worry anymore. I just look forward to it. And I look forward to the energy that I experience walking into the auditorium, walking into the building. It is amazing. I want to add my thank yous to the speakers, exhibitors, sponsors, volunteers, and each of you who is here in person and virtually. And I also want to point out the really well done conference um, brochure that has um, that notes all the conference um, supporters and the um, and the volunteers and the people who've really contributed to making this so effective. And I, I'll just, without naming people, I'll just add my thank you to all the faculty and other sponsors, staff behind the scenes who have worked with our students so tirelessly. This conference is an enduring statement of our school's legacy, our values, and commitment to building health equity and inclusive excellence. As Samuel pointed out, the, um, the goals of that have evolved over the years, but they have remained um, constant in terms of our commitment to health equity. And, um, and I also want to thank the people who've come before, like Jeannie Eng and, um, and Vic Schoenbach, who've been so important. We really are standing on the shoulders of giants. Um, and new people have infused the, um, the legacy with new excitement. And I want to introduce Dr. Colleen Cipriani, um, if you'll stand, who started Monday, a really important week. <laughs> She's our new Assistant Dean for Inclusive Excellence and an Associate Professor in Public Health Leadership. She came from Purdue University's Vet School where she did amazing work to increase inclusive excellence. So expect to see more of us and, uh, and more of you over the, la over the next few years. Um, we're really excited about being here. I want to commend the students for their selection of this year's theme. Never has this conference been needed more than it is today. We're living in a historic moment, an inflection point in which our Ameri American narrative is at risk. The idealized narrative with, of course, imperfect realization is that this country is a melting pot and that everyone is welcome and should have a chance to make it here. As President Obama said so well on many occasions, no one makes it entirely alone and everyone makes it, who makes it gets some help along the way. Today, that hopeful narrative about this as the welcoming land of opportunity for all is at risk, allowing the immigrant story to be co-opted to focus on an alternative fact saga of game, gang members, criminals, and thugs does injustice to the American values. It's an insult to the memory of all of our relatives and all of you who came here seeking a better life and a fairer chance at the future, including my own grandfather who came here in steerage class on a boat in um, 1903. 
Most definitions of narrative refer to a spoken or written story of connected events. Now that should also be digital and electronic. Found in all forms of creativity, narratives help to reinforce a sense of who we are and what we share. They can help to bring statistics to life and create community and foster political and social change. Narratives and stories can educate, acculturate, motivate, navigate, and re resonate. At their very best, they facilitate shared purpose and commitment to the greater good and the achievement of all. They enable people with shared histories to pass those on. You in this room today can help to reshape the narrative, to reclaim the narrative. And I thank you all for being here to do that. I want to leave you with a suggestion about telling stories from um, Dhruv Color, a physician communicator who spoke at the um, Think Academy sponsored by the Levine Cancer Center that Cornell Wright and I were both at last week. I think whatever your role, you can use this information. So Dhruv said, first, tell the story of self. Why are you called to a particular issue? Second, tell the story of us. How does whatever you're passionate about, your research, your practice, whatever, um, connect to the experiences of people around you, around us? Third, tell the story of now. What makes the challenge you're addressing so urgent? And finally, he suggested that we should tell no stories without statistics and no statistics without stories. I thought that was really good advice and I see there are some sessions that, um, that really address that. I hope you'll be invigorated and excited by today's um, speakers, by the chance to interact with really fascinating people, um, by gaining new knowledge and skills, connections, and just being here and drinking in this tremendous excitement at the 39th Annual Minority Health Conference. Now I am honored to introduce my friend and colleague, Dr. Rume Alexander, who is Chief Diversity Officer and Associate Vice Chancellor at this campus. Dr. Alexander is an extraordinary leader and a brilliant and tireless champion for equity and diversity. She's helped our school and many of the schools on campus. Her high impact work, both nationally and internationally, her passion for equity of opportunity, and her penchant for courageous dialogues have led to appointments on landmark healthcare initiatives. She's won many awards, including the American Organization of Nurse Executives PRISM Award for Workforce Diversity Leadership. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Rume Alexander. I always like it when Dean Romer introduces me. I almost have to pinch myself and say, who is she talking about? So good morning. I am delighted to be here and I want to start by telling you a story. There was a little girl who was about five to six years old who fell in her mother and father's home because she was reaching for something that she wasn't supposed to be reaching for. She was a climber, so she jumped off of sofas and porches and anything else that uh, seemed too high for her. But this time she fell, and she hit her head on the cornerstones of the, where the two baseboards meet, like at the foot of a, of a wall. S cut the back of her head. Her parents heard the impact of that from outside, Come run, came running in, she was covered in blood, she was taken to the emergency room, and the physician sent the mother out, asked the father to hold the child while he put stitches in the back of her head without anesthesia. So every time the suture went in, the, the, the needle to suture went in, she would go up in the air and her father would pull her down. 
this, this notion that this child, who happened to be African American, had a pain threshold that was almost inhumane, but that was the thought, didn't need anesthesia, may have set into motion a whole number of other things in her life. That little girl was me. And at the time, no one knew other than I had a hard head <laughs> and a lot of resilience that some years later, and we will not say how many, <laughs> she would be standing before you to, as the Vice Chancellor for Inclusion and Diversity and the Chief Diversity Officer for the University and a chance to talk about how important stories are. Now, if I hadn't told you that story, you wouldn't know anything, you wouldn't know that about me. If I had not felt that I could share it with you. And this is why this is such an important conference and why the theme you have chosen is so important. We have to tell all our stories, the good and the bad. We are inundated with stories, whether they be investigations, news reports, position papers, filling out a survey, history telling, and sometimes even a song that you just hum to yourselves. They have the power to perpetuate labels, labels that steal your identity, labels that divide, labels that keep us from working together and understanding each other. So here's what we know. Stories release in our brains both oxytocin, which I like to co call the love hormone, when someone listens to a character-driven story. Or you release the hormone cortisol, which rises at the arc of a story, promoting a powerful emotional reaction, even when the listener knows the story is fiction. We're drawn to stories. We want to understand what's underneath it, what really happened, and how did it happen. And so I want to leave you with this. You are the expert on you. Nobody knows your story better than you know your story. So don't let anybody else tell your story. You do it, both the good and the bad, because no one can tell your story like you. This conference and this theme is spot on for where we are this day. It is so wonderful to have you all here, and I know the rest of the day is going to be fantastic. So I'm just going to ask you to do one other thing. Find somebody near you and tell them, tell your story. Do that now. Okay, I don't want you to give them too much information. <laughs> or more information than they need. But sometime today, find the time to tell and share one of your stories. As uh, they often say in the black church tradition, you have to have been tested to give your testimony. So you give your testimony and enjoy this wonderful, wonderful conference. Welcome and enjoy the day.
Monica Ray Simpson is the executive director of Sister Song Women of Color Reproductive Justice Collective. A native of rural North Carolina, Monica has organized extensively against human rights violations, reproductive oppression, the prison industrial complex, racism and intolerance, and is deeply invested in Southern movement building and the fight for black liberation. She is also committed to birth justice as a certified doula. Monica couples her activism with her artistry and released her first live album entitled Revolutionary Love, where she blends her gospel roots and her passion for social justice with deep soul to create the sound known as Revolutionary Soul. Because of her artivism, Monica was named as a new civil rights leader by Essence Magazine and chosen as one of Advocate Magazine's 40 Under 40 Leaders. Please join me in welcoming our 20th annual William T. Small Jr. keynote lecture, Monica Ray Simpson. Good morning. Good morning. Look at this beautiful crowd out here. Y'all are absolutely gorgeous to look at. I've done something, um, Bart, with my thing. I don't know what I did but I'm trying to get my life together up here. <laughs> so hold this here situation. Y'all can give me a second, right? Okay, maybe I did it, I think I did it. Yay! Oh, so let me tell y'all something. Let me tell y'all a little bit about myself before we get started with this here conversation this morning. Um, I am not one of those speakers um, that's gonna give you like graphs and charts I'm not going to like speak to you as if this is like, you know, a newsroom. When I step into a room, my goal is to make a room and an experience feel like we're family and we're together, right? And so are y'all willing to like be down with me today and like, can we just be family up in here today? That makes it so much easier for me to have a conversation with you, right? Every I got everyone's consent. Okay. I'm ready. I'm good to go. I want y'all to give it up to this, this, this amazing person right here. He has been hooking me up all morning. I'm very grateful for that. Um, so today I want to, you know, have this conversation. I titled this thing, Achieving Health Equity and Justice Through the Reproductive Justice Framework. And this conversation today is really going to be one that helps you all in this room understand more about the reproductive justice framework and why this framework and this movement is so critical to us really achieving health equity and justice in this country. But before I get into all of that, I definitely wanna say how honored I am to be able to speak today and to be chosen to be the William T. Small Jr. <laughs> keynote speaker. Like when I got this invitation from these amazing co-chairs, I want y'all to give it up one more time for Melissa and Shakira. <laughs> when I got this invitation, I was like, what? They want me to come speak, what? This is pretty amazing, and who's this guy? Wow, right? So I did my research, you know, I had to, you know, I had to do my research. And I was a little bit, you know, intimidated after, you know, hearing, you know, all the amazing work that this conference has been doing over the, ne the past 39 years and the work of Mr. Small. So I'm just, again, I'm grateful. And I wanna say that before I get started talking to like young folks, y'all, I just wanna give love to the young folks in the room um, young folks are really, y'all are turning up for us right now, right? Y'all are really making the way, you are paving a new, and like really it's paving new territory for us in this country. I mean, how their young folks are changing the discourse around every sector of our lives right now. So I just, I'm, I can't quite claim young folk no more. Um, <laughs> you know, I'm still under 40, so that's, a, that I'm, I'm somewhat young, but I just really wanna give you love to the young folks because you all have been making this conference happen for the past 39 years and the choice of this particular theme this year around narratives, especially with this particular political climate and where we are in the world today just speaks to your genius, to your expertise and your deep connection to like what's really going on in the world. So mad love to the young folks today, y'all, all right? Um, I also wanna wish everybody a happy Black History Month, right? <laughs> Yes. You know, I celebrate black history every day of the year, but I do think it's also important. 
um, for us to like, you know, give honor to this time um, of the year where we kind of like take that concentrated effort to really lift up the work of black folks in this country and around the world. And I also want to say that for me to be able to do this speech during Black History Month is pretty amazing. And for me to be doing this speech in the month where Black Panther came out, you know, <laughs> you know, I'm feeling really lucky right now. You know, Wakanda forever, you feel me? So. Um, so I got really excited when I saw this theme because narratives, hey auntie, yes, okay. Um, <laughs> that was my best part, of, well no, there were many parts of the movie that I love, but that just, that run true. Um, if you haven't seen the movie, see it because it's worth, it will change your life. But when I, when I saw this particular theme and I thought about, you know, the fact that narratives and storytelling is so critical and so important to me, but also so essential to the reproductive justice movement, I thought, yeah, it's really time for us to talk about and think about what does it mean to reclaim our narratives, our stories, and not to actually walk away from them, but to center them in how we do our work, how we do our research, how we connect with one another. So, before I got started, you know, to talk about reproductive justice, it's important that I take a moment, just like my sister did who came up before me, to tell you a little bit about who I am. Are y'all all right with that? So our bios don't really tell us much, right? They're, they're really, you know, designed to let people know that you have a little bit of expertise about something and you have the right to talk about something, right? Um, and I'm grateful for bios, but you know, they don't really tell your story. They just really help people, you know, understand a little bit about who you are. But I, I grew up in Union County, North Carolina. How many folks are familiar with Union County? Oh, snap! Because let me tell you, most folks don't know anything about Union County. I grew up in Wingate, North Carolina. How many folks know Wingate, North Carolina? Oh, there are people raising their hands in the room? This is exciting. Because I go all across the country talking about reproductive justice and other amazing things, and I say I'm from Wingate, North Carolina, and it's always dead silent. So it feels good to be home <laughs> in North Carolina because people can understand like what I mean when I say Wingate, North Carolina, and growing up in a town where there's a huge center for Jesse Helms that I have to pass by every time I go home. That actually means something, right? Um, but in growing up in Union County, for me, you know, the epicenter of my community, because, you know, it's a small little college town, Wingate University is there, but there's not much else happening in Wingate. Right, so for us, the epicenter of our community was the black church. So the black church is where I got my organizing roots, it's where I learned how to talk to folk, it's where I learned that I had gifts, like I could sing, I could, you know, move people, like it's really the place that I feel like I got a chance to shine and really show up as a leader. And growing up in the black church, I was able to see a couple of different things, right, that really helped me to, you know, walk a little bit further and closer towards my work around reproductive justice and social justice work in general. So I remember growing up in the church and how many folks remember being, being in church all day long, right? Yeah, all day long, you were in church, right? And so, you know, you sat through the missionary meeting, the usher board meeting, the, you know, all the different meetings, you know? And then at the end of the day, we got to go in the fellowship hall and eat, right? And I remember that spread in the fellowship hall, it was fried chicken, ham, potato salad, macaroni and cheese, all the baked goods you most possibly could have, cornbread, stuffing, dumplings, right? I mean, it just kept coming. All this, I mean, this huge spread. And I could see that's where all the love was happening, right? Because the elders would be there serving the food and the young folks would be running around. It was a beautiful sight to see. But then, you know, I would hear, you know, talks as folks were sitting down after dinner talking about their sugar, being a little high, right? I got to go get my pressure checked, right? I didn't know what those words meant as a kid, but I could see the impact it was having on the bodies and the energy of the people who were holding space and leading me as a young person. I also remember my church pianist. He was one of my favorite folks in the church. Like this man, his voice, his ability to play those keys, like he just, every Sunday he would just mesmerize me. And then all of a sudden he, he died, like really suddenly. And I remember that having an impact on me, and I asked, you know, my mom and the, and, the, and the adults, I was like, so what happened to him? I didn't even know he was sick, you know? And they said, oh, well, he just died of pneumonia. But nobody was really ready to talk about what HIV AIDS really meant to our communities at the time. 
And then I remember as I was growing up in my adolescence, right, and, you know, you start to smell yourself as the... Um, as the, uh, as the older folks would say, and so we're all really getting excited about going to prom and who you going to prom with and who you talking to and who is your boo and all of these different things, right? And I remember us having a conversation about, hey, did you get that, that copy of the prom promise? Are you going to sign that prom promise situation? The prom promise said that you weren't supposed to have sex, right, for, 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 for prom. And if you signed it, you got to go to Carowinds to get a pizza. Now, both of those things were very exciting for me, right? <laughs> So I didn't really care what the prom promise said. I was just very excited about eating and going to Carowinds, okay? So, yeah, we were all signing this prom promise, but not really thinking about what that meant. And then I really thought to myself, did it really make a difference? Because most of the young women who were in my church were pregnant before graduating high school. And nobody was talking about sex. No one was talking about our reproductive health care and what we needed to be able to make the best decisions for ourselves. So, you know, I was like, okay, I'm going to make it through Wingate. I'm going to make it through Union County times. You know, I'm grateful for the time at my church because it really helped to shape my worldview a little bit. And so I, I journeyed off to school. I wanted to go to an HBCU because I grew up watching Whitley Gilbert and Dwayne Wayne. <laughs> and I was determined to have that experience, right? I was also very determined to be a gamma ray, even though I was dark-skinned, right? <laughs> um... It's very important, you know, Spy, <laughs> we're just celebrating like the 25th anniversary of that movie, I know that, right? Um, uh, school days, if you haven't seen that, watch that too, it'll change your life. Um, <laughs> but I remember like, you know, stepping into my HBCU experience at Johnson C. Smith University. Hey, JCSU in the building, somebody. Um, and I remember, right, you know, taking those steps to stepping into my adult self and coming out while I was in school. And I was like, this will be a good place to come out because I'm definitely not in Union County. I get to spread my wings a little bit more, and, and I think that maybe I'll be a little bit safer, right? And unfortunately, I wasn't. I wasn't safe. It, there wasn't really any resources for me to, like, really look to and connect to to help me really think about what this new identity was that I was kind of grappling with. And then I would have friends that were coming to me in school, and one of my dear friends, she came to me, and she's like, yo, I'm the first person in my, in my family to go to college, and... I'm pregnant, and I'm not really interested in that right now. I want to finish school. I, I want to have an abortion. And I'm like, whoa, what's that word? You know, black folks don't do that. What do you mean? We, we, we have babies, right? You're you just going to have the baby and keep going to school. She's like, no, I don't want to. I'm not ready for this, and I have the right to make this decision. And that's what really helped to shift the way that I thought about choice and decision-making and access, and support, right? So I say all of these different things as I talk about my journey to help you understand that, you know, our lives are not like these monolithic things. They're not single issues, right? And as we're celebrating, you know, Black History Month and Audre Lorde's birthday was just February 18th, and she said something really powerful that really helped to catalyze, I believe, the work of the reproductive justice movement. Audre Lorde said we cannot have single-issue movements because we don't live single-issue lives. And so if you all just take a moment just to close your eyes for a second, right, and just think about those different points along your journey, your story, what got you into this room today. I don't think anything happens by happenstance. I don't think that, you know, it's just some freak of nature that I'm standing before you all as, you know, a North Carolina native talking about all these different issues. Like, we all have those different moments along our journey that bring us closer into the knowing of who we are and the work that we are committed to and what we want to actually bring forth into the world. That's why I was so excited about this thing, right? So I want y'all to also think about, like, who was the first person that ever gave you care, right? Like, if you weren't feeling too good, was a little sick, who was the first person that ever gave you care? Y'all can talk to me, too. That's really okay. I'm down for call and response because I'm from the black church, right? <laughs> who, was, who was that? Mom. Your mom, right? Who else? My grandma. It was my Mima. Let me tell you, she would be in that kitchen concocting some stuff. I don't even know what she was putting together. I don't know if it was legal. I don't know. 
I don't know. I have no idea what she was putting together, but she was this alchemist in there, right? Putting these different things together that really helped me to like get rid of the cold or to feel good. I'm sure there was some alcohol involved, but I just feel that all the things that she pulled together, I knew at the end of the day I was gonna feel better. So, so in our community, like going to the doctor wasn't always the first option. It was never really the first option. And it wasn't the first option for many different reasons, right? So for, for, for some people in my community, it was around fear. I remember, you know, sitting on the front porch with my grandma and her friends, and they were, you know, chewing their tobacco and spitting in their cups, and I would listen to their, you know, conversations, and they would say, well, you going to go to the doctor? Nah, I'm not going to the doctor. Nah, nah. Nah, I don't know what they're going to do to me. I don't know, right? The fear that comes into play when folks think about interacting with the medical industrial complex, when people think about like how folks are like bringing, you know, getting statistics from them or getting information from them, it really puts a barrier for a lot of communities who are coming with trauma, right? Deeply embedded in their DNA that goes from slavery to colonization to all the different ways that we have seen violations on black and brown bodies in this country. That is something that is real and has an impact on the way that people really want to interact with our healthcare system. For some people, it's also about access, right? Again, I grew up in Union County, we in Wingate. If you didn't have a car to get over to Monroe, which is where most of the doctors were, how were you actually going to get access to the very care that you needed? Everyone didn't have a car, everyone didn't have access to be able to like even pay to get the care that they needed. Like currently right now, are we aware that black women are only making 64 cents on a dollar in this country? So can you think about what that has looked like over the years? It hasn't changed, right? So the most marginalized communities are at the bottom of the economic scale. So how does that really impact the way that they get access to what they need? For some people too, you know, it wasn't just about access, it wasn't just about their fear. It was about all the other different issues that were coming into play that, that sometimes took a little bit more precedence, right, over their own health. In our community, criminalization was huge, right? Prison industrial complex really, I saw it tear apart our communities. I saw it really like just wreak havoc on the way that people dealt with each other, how they really were able to like get what they needed for themselves because they were dealing with family members that were going into the system and them trying to prepare, and prepare themselves for what that loss meant, and also how would they care for their communities with, you know, less, less you know, access to income or, you know, less support for themselves. And we can just go on and on and on about the many different social justice issues that come into play into everyone's life at any given moment. And these overlapping layers, right, of oppression that show up in the lives of marginalized communities in this country. So when we talk about those overlapping, you know, layers of oppression, what are we talking about? We're talking about this, this analysis that is now kind of seeping into so many of our different sectors right now, intersectionality, right? We're, we're hearing about this word now. Everyone's like, yeah, we get that. We want to be intersectional, right? We want to understand this, and everyone's running, you know, with this word. And it's important for us to do that, but it was really like this, this, this analysis that was really brought forth by black women in this country, right? That really helped us understand that we can't, again, like Audre Lorde said, look at a, a single issue. We have to look at how all of these many different issues impact our ability to make decisions about our lives and to live our healthiest lives. So, Sister Song, right? is an organization now that's celebrating 20 years this year. Well, last year we celebrated 20 years as an organization. Yeah? And Sister Song was founded by 16 women of color-led organizations all across this country, from a native indigenous women to black women, Latinas, Asian Pacific Islander women, who said that they knew that our communities needed to have a stronger voice around our, the fullness of our lives, and more importantly, our reproductive lives. And so Sister Song has been a national membership organization now for two decades, and our mission is really to amplify and lift up the voices and the leadership and expertise of indigenous women and women of color in this country to achieve reproductive justice and to dismantle and to take away reproductive oppression in this country and to secure our human rights. 
So how did reproductive justice really come into be? Because again, we're talking about how do we use this framework, right, to actually achieve health equity and justice in this country, right? So this, this, this reproductive justice movement came to be back in 1994. So this is Loretta Ross. How many folks in the room know Loretta Ross? Yes. Talk about just amazing powerhouse. She's the first national coordinator for Sister Song, but she's also a leading voice and, and just amazing academic theorist, speaker, right, who helps us really understand so much of what reproductive justice is. And she helps us, like, in this, in this particular quote, understand what, how reproductive justice came to be. So in 1994, there were a group of black women who were coming together in Chicago because there were many conversations going on at the time, and this was also at the height of healthcare reform in this country. And black women were like, if we're gonna talk about healthcare reform in this country today, in 1994, we are not going to exclude the most marginalized communities, and we're definitely not going to exclude our sexual and reproductive rights, right? We need to make sure that those things are centered in this conversation and that they're not separated from this larger conversation on health in this country. And so these women came together and called themselves Women of African Descent for Reproductive Justice because they wanted to blend this conversation of reproductive health and rights in this country with social justice. And they were bringing this from a global context where they were hearing what was happening globally with women all across the country, where they were at, all across the world, where they were already making that linkage, right? And they wanted to bring that knowledge and, and bring that back to the United States and use that as a way to actually impact policy and impact the conversation on health care reform in this country. And so for them, it was important for them to root their work in the human rights framework, right, which made it more expansive and actually helped us connect to a more global context. But they also wanted to make sure that it was intersectional, right? Just like in the story that I shared with you all, like that kind of walked me into this work, they wanted to make sure that that was that, that sentiment, right, the ability for us to see the multiple layers of our lives, the multiple layers of oppression, how that impacts our decision making, they wanted to make sure that that was central to this framework. And so this is a quote here from Kimberly Crenshaw, who is actually credited um, a lot with, you know, helping to really amplify and name intersectionality in this country. And she says, in every generation and in every intellectual sphere and in every political moment, there have been African American women who have articulated the need to think and talk about race through a lens that looks at gender or think and talk about feminism through a lens that looks at race. So this is a continuity with that. So I believe that this is exactly what the women who came together to really birth and name the reproductive justice movement were actually doing. And so these were the women that were in the room together. And they said that it is time for us to really re-articulate. It's time for us to reclaim the narrative, right, of how we talk about our reproductive lives, how we talk about the fullness of our lives, and how we help to shift the conversation on healthcare in this country. And so these women came from many different perspectives, right? Some were faith leaders, some were doing policy work, some were um, doing, you know, activist work, HIV AIDS, coming from, you know, from many different perspectives. And so the fullness of that room really helped to birth what we now know as the reproductive justice movement. And so these women didn't only create right, this, this framework that has now transformed into this massive, beautiful movement, but they also did a direct action, right? So in 1994, they pulled their resources and their energy together to actually do a call to action to Congress on health care reform. Again, they put this call to action into the Washington Post, and it was signed over with over 800 folks, you know, championing this with them, saying that if you are going to talk about health care in this country, then you are going to trust black women, you are going to trust our expertise, and you are going to center what we know is most important for our communities. This was a huge turning point for reproductive justice, as it helped to really you know, solidify this work, but it was also a really bold move, right, from black women in 1994 to say that we coming for you, Congress, right? We coming for you because you're trying to come for our communities. And so we want to know that we see you and we are going to stand, right, um, and what we know is most important for us and for our community. So what is reproductive justice? Because a lot of people, you know, are now really getting wind of what this reproductive justice work is really about. But to really just help define and help you all understand what really the tenets of the work are, 
We talk about reproductive justice as the fact that every individual has the human right to one, decide if and when they will have a child and the conditions under which they will give birth. Two, every individual has the human right to decide if they don't want a child. And they get to decide those options for, for preventing or ending a pregnancy. That every individual has the human right to parent the children they already have with the necessary social supports and safe environments and healthy communities and without fear of violence from individuals or the government. And lastly, it really is about our human right to bodily autonomy, free from all forms of oppression and violence, right? We want to be able to live free and free indeed. We want to be able to make sure that folks have access to what they need to be healthy, but to also thrive, right? That is really what reproductive justice is. And as this work started, it did start very womb-centered, right? It started very much about like having children, not having children, pregnancy. And as the movement has grown, and because of its intersectional nature, and because of it being rooted in human rights, it really gives us the ability to talk about reproduction, not just from like a birthing perspective, but if we're talking about wanting to live lives where, our, where we have the ability to live into our destiny, right, to be able to create whatever it is that we came to this planet to bring into fruition, that we need the necessary supports for that. We need to make sure that violence is not prohibiting us from doing that and that we're able to live into our fullest potential, right? So it's not just about having children and not having children. It is truly about us living into our fullest potential and having access to what we need to do that, to do that in a healthy way, right, so that we can, you know, shine, right? So the vision for reproductive justice is when all people have the economic, social, and political power and resources to make healthy decisions about our bodies, sexuality, and reproduction for ourselves, families, and our communities in all areas of our lives. See, what the, the beautiful thing about what this movement is for me is that, you know, I've done a lot of work across many different movements, right? From LGBTQ liberation work to work against the prison industrial complex, and I can go on and on about the many different entry points to social justice work that I've had. But whenever I found the reproductive justice movement, right, what was really powerful about this movement is that I did not have to check any identity of mine at the door, right? This wasn't a movement and a framework that allowed me to say that I can bring my full self into the conversation, right? I don't have to move my womb over here, my vagina over here, you know what I'm saying? My queer over here. I don't have to move any of that out of the way, right? Because I don't walk, you know, this, you know, I walk together, right? And this movement allows that. It, it allows for the, the fullness of who we are to actually show up and to actually be held sacred, right? And to be included in how we do the work. So if we're talking about reproductive justice, there's four main things I want you all to understand that's really important to how we want folks to really implement this framework, right? One, it's important that you, <laughs> this framework is about centering the most marginalized community, right? It's about centering the most marginalized voices, those who are on the margins, right? We move that, those folks, those voices, those experiences to the center because when we make that shift happen, that's actually what helps us to create the change that we want to see in the world. We don't see change happen whenever the most privileged, right, whenever the ones with the most power continue to hold on to that. That's not how change happens in this country, right? It happens when we actually shift that dynamic, and that's what reproductive justice asserts. We also are really, in order to do this work, you have to understand and be willing to work on human rights. Now, a lot of people, you know, don't even really know that there's like this universal declaration on the, for human rights, right? It's a very new concept, and it's a new concept because the U.S. sucks in terms of our, you know, human rights report card, right? We suck. We absolutely suck. But reproductive justice understood that if we're talking about the most marginalized communities, if we're talking about dismantling systems of oppression, that if we want to do that, we cannot build that only on a U.S. Constitution that did not mean for most of us in this room to actually survive and thrive, right? So we needed a framework that would actually be able to hold the fullness of who we are. Also, you can't do this without understanding and implementing intersectionality. We talked about that a little bit, but we don't want to talk about intersectionality as a buzzword. Loretta Ross says that intersectionality is, you know, the process, right? Human rights is the goal, right? So we have to see intersectionality and, and the analysis that it brings as our process to actually securing our human rights. 
And lastly, we can't do this work without working to dismantle white supremacy. Can we all say white supremacy in the room? It's a real thing, right? This is not something that I don't, I, and I wanted to be intentional about saying white supremacy and not just racism, right? Because sometimes that's the way that, you know, folks can kind of skirt around like the really like scary, real, you know, impact of white supremacy in this country. And it really does take each and every individual working to dismantle this system in order for us to actually start to move closer towards liberation. So you cannot implement or talk about reproductive justice in your work, in your practice, if you are not actively working to dismantle the systems of white supremacy, okay? So how has the RJ framework really impacted our, what, what, what has been the impact, I should say, of the RJ framework? So, he doesn't like me. Ha, there we go. So how many people remember seeing, hearing about this billboard? The most dangerous place for an African-American child is in the mother's womb was another one, right? So in 2010, there was this really egregious, racist, ridiculous billboard campaign that swept across the country, starting in Atlanta, Georgia, where these billboards came up from a very right-wing, very anti-choice group saying that black women are having too many abortions in this country. And so instead of us like, you know, supporting what black women actually need, we're going to shame them for their reproductive decision making, right? And we said, no, you will not do that. Because it's interesting to us that we want, that this group wanted to shame black women, but they didn't want to talk about the fact that, again, black women are only making 64 cents on the dollar. They didn't want to talk about access to health care, especially in the South, is almost impossible, right? They didn't want to talk about the fact that the rising rates of interpersonal violence in this country and the conversations that we're now having around Me Too and all the different things that are coming to fruition very much impacts our abilities to live our full lives and it impacts our reproductive decision making, right? They also didn't want to talk about the fact that black children are being gunned down in the streets, right? And that police brutality and the criminal justice system and the prison industrial complex are tearing apart our families. So it was really interesting that they wanted to take this very single issue, you know, um, what Lynn's way of talking about the work and excluding the fullness of our lives as black women. And so because of this, the Trust Black Women Partnership was formed because we wanted to have a collective and united voice and front against any attack to our reproductive freedom and our ability to make our own decisions about our lives, right? So the reproductive justice framework allowed us to work across different sectors. It allowed us to bring in our personal stories, right, to help us actually combat, right, this very, very ridiculous campaign. Also, when we think about reproductive justice framework and talking about maternal and child health in this country and how the rising rates of maternal mortality is a very scary thing in this country, right? The fact that we are one, the most industrialized country in the world and that we have rising rates of maternal mortality whenever there are countries who, are, who have compromised water systems, right, and their maternal mortality rates are decreasing, there is a problem in this country, right? And so the reproductive justice framework allowed us to really dig deeper into the very core roots of what this issue is. And it has its roots in racism, y'all. It's not just about, you know, oh, folks are not going to the doctor, they're not getting prenatal vitamins. No, it's about how people are being treated when they go into the doctor. It's about how people are being handled, right, the access to information that they're getting. And so we are like lifting this issue up as a reproductive justice issue and implementing a reproductive justice frame for us to be able to address this huge issue. Also, when thinking about our connection to the work of black liberation in this country, like I, I, I said before, like my, my ability to live free in this country <laughs> is very important to me, right? I plan to do that every single day and I try to live as a free black woman as much as I can every single day. And I do know that there are many things that, you know, impact that and make it difficult at the same time. And so my, my you can't separate my, 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 my desire and my, my calling to fight for black liberation 
from my very real desire to make sure that reproductive justice is achieved in this country. My, I, they're inextricably linked to each other. And so we were able to have deeper conversations with the movement for black lives, Black Lives Matter, about this larger conversation on health and family and body autonomy, right? That wasn't just talking about it from the lens of police brutality and what that looks like um, and how that's impacting our communities, but how you know all of that comes into play, all of our work is connected. And so we did this solidarity statement with Black Lives Matter and the Trust Black Women work to actually help people understand that there, you can't separate us. Right? And that's exactly what our opposition tries to do. They try to find every way to move wedges in between our communities, in between our movements, to make us separate from each other. So no, I'm gonna still talk about our, my, my human right to make sure that abortion remains legal and safe in this country, and I'm gonna call your butt out whenever you are you know, gunning down people in our community. Those things are not separate from each other, right? It's about the fullness of our lives and having access to what we need and to be able to be free and safe, right? Also, um, a very specific piece of work that we did around LARCs, right? Long-acting reversible contraceptives. Whenever we seen like this huge uptick and folks saying, let's move LARCs, you know, to the center, let's push LARCs further and further, right? And we're like, yay, we want more access to contraception and whoa, let's be mindful about what this has looked like historically in our community, right? And if we see this, this you know, if we, if, we, if we have these moments where we see like, oh, there's like a lot of emphasis and a lot of money going into one particular method, it, 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 you know, the reproductive justice framework makes us pause. It makes us stop. It makes us ask questions. It makes us go back to our stories, our narratives, our history to make sure that it's not repeating itself, right? And so we work with the National Women's Health Network to create this statement of principles on what it looks like to really implement LARCs, right, from a reproductive justice um, perspective. So what does all this mean, y'all, right? You know, I, I didn't came to y'all and talked to y'all about reproductive justice. Um, I didn't told y'all my business, <laughs> um, which is fine. I'm, to I'm totally fine with that. But I, 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 have, I have a couple of questions I want to leave you all with because I actually want to leave you today with an invitation. Um, so my first question is, so if we want to talk about health equity in this country, where there is a desire for everyone to have the opportunity to attain their highest level of health, and if we only do that from a single issue lens, are we actually, are we actually living into the fullness of health equity? And I don't think that we are. I don't think that we can look at health equity just from an equity perspective. I think it's important for us to look at it from a justice perspective. And that is what reproductive justice, right, and its framework really is focused on. And so if, we, if we're really focused on like moving from just looking at equity and making sure people have what they need to actually looking at a justice framework that allows us to look at the fullness of our lives that also incorporates our stories and our narratives. I think that is where we start to move closer and closer to our folks actually getting what they best need for themselves. So if you all were to think about how to implement a reproductive justice frame into your work, into your practice, into your research, what would that look like, right? Are you willing to really center the most marginalized, truly, in your work? Are you willing to be intersectional in, how you, in, in your approach and in your analysis? Are you willing to think about the ways that your work, your research, um, intersects with the human rights framework? And are you willing to really uplift that in your work? And are you finding every way possible to make sure that whatever you're producing, whatever work that you're doing, whatever care that you're providing, that you are working to dismantle the system of white supremacy. If you are willing to do those things, good folks, then you are stepping into the reproductive justice framework. And I believe the further we step into that framework, the more care we're able to provide, the more health, right, our communities get, and the more justice our communities get. So, I want to leave time for some questions. So I want to make sure that I start to bring some things down um, for you all. But um, I've been doing a lot of study lately on, you know, as this, again, this, this conference theme was just so right on time. I've been doing a lot of study on like, you know, what has it looked like historically for us, you know, especially with this particular administration who has made it very abundantly clear that they don't give a damn about our lives. They really don't, right? And so, and I'm not even saying that from a non, I'm not saying, I'm saying that from a nonpartisan perspective, right? 
But I'm also just saying that as a black woman who lives in the United States of America, like what you are telling me, what you are showing me is that you don't care about my life. And so I've been really looking back to see how have we cared for each other? How have we made sure that our communities had what we needed, right, in times of distress, in times of like crazy, crazy, you know, administration, scary administration? How has it worked? And I've been really thinking about, you know, abolition, right? A whole lot. And I know that that word kind of freaks some folks out sometimes, right? I get it. But when I think about like the story of the abolitionists of the time and how they were willing to go against whatever the status quo was to make sure that people had a, a, a route to freedom. If we were to like, and you know, just bring that analysis over into this conversation about healthcare, right? How radical are you willing to be in your practice, in what you create, in your research that takes people closer to, their, to, to the best health? You all have a role to play in that. So my invitation for you all today is to really think about the ways in which you can use this framework in your work. But also, my invitation to you is that you don't just see yourself as a public health professional, but that you see yourself as an organizer. It, this is not the time anymore, y'all, for us to like hide behind letters, to hide behind institutions, to hide behind our research, right? This is the time for us to actually be bold and radical and use the skills that have come to us through these institutions, through our research, right? To actually interrogate the system, to shake this system, to move our narratives and our stories so close to the center that they don't have a choice but to listen. You all have a role to play in that. And I think that this framework of reproductive justice will help you move closer to that because we need you. And this is not, again, this is not the time for you not to think of yourself as an organizer, to not think of yourself as an activist. People's lives are on the line. And if we see our work as making sure that people get the health that they need, then we can't turn a blind eye to that. And it's time for us to raise our fists, to move into the streets and away from the boardrooms, away from the, 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 you know, all the, all the windows and the fluorescent lights and stuff. <laughs> we got to move away from that and closer into the communities that we say that we want to serve. So that's my invitation for you all. Are y'all willing to take it? Yes, Thank you so much. Thank you. Y'all got to sit down because I got some questions. I want some questions. I do want some questions. And um, unfortunately, y'all, um, this is a very jam-packed weekend. And so there is a huge Power Rising conference going on, building an agenda for black women, happening in Atlanta, Georgia, that I must get back to as well. Um, so unfortunately, I'm going to have to scoot out of here very quickly. Um, but I don't want to do that without having an opportunity to engage with y'all. Um, ask some questions. Tell me how you felt about it, you know. Talk about my necklace or something. I don't know, whatever you want to do. <laughs> but I actually just got them very excited about. I like it a lot. <laughs> right. Got it here in Durham. Yeah. So we'll quickly open the floor for questions. There are standing mics on either side of the room if folks want to line up and ask questions really quick. Maybe a few. Maybe we'll have about 10 minutes for questions. Yeah. And I promise you, no question is like crazy. You can ask me whatever you want. Hi. I think it's all of those things, right? <laughs> Truly. And I think it's about identifying what lane best fits you, 
right? Because I think that sometimes, with, especially with this framework that is very intersectional, it's a lot of things, it's very difficult for folks to find like, well, it's so big, I don't know where to land. You have to find your lane. So if, I think that advocacy is super important, right? And if you have a role or if you have the ability to like really um, help folks in the community understand their rights and get connected to the issue, then that's your lane. If you are someone within the system and you get, you, you trying to buck that a little bit, mm -hmm. right, then you be up in that system and you find your ways to actually buck that system. Um, and we can't do all of that work though in silos. So all of those different pieces of work actually need to be in communication with each other for us to be effective. Because I think that what has been happening right, is that we have strong advocacy efforts, like strong internal like, you know, work happening within the system, and like, they're, but they're not communicating with each other, right? And so I think all the things need to happen and we need to find better ways, especially locally, because you could do that better when you're local, right? Yeah. To make sure those um, conversations are happening across those different sectors. Yeah. Oh, great. Good morning, I'm Jasmine Wilkins. I work with Hi. IPASS here in Chapel Hill. Um, hello. Thank you so much for your riveting talk. I'm so moved, but, and I know so many of us in this room were. Um, I just wondered if you could speak to some of the challenges and the opportunities that you and your organization have found in including the lived experiences of queer and trans individuals in the reproductive justice movement. Yes, can you say the question one more time? I didn't hear the first part. Sure, if you could speak to some of the challenges and opportunities that you all have found in, in centering the lived experiences of trans and queer individuals. Yeah, yeah. Um, so there's, I think I love the question because it there, there are always challenges and there's always opportunities, right? And so I think the opportunity, I'll start there, has really been for us to have more voices, more expertise, um, more experiences to actually pull from for us to actually help to, for us to like frame the work and for, for people to see the many different um, entry points or the many different perspectives of work, right? So I think that the more stories that we bring in, the more experiences that we center, we're actually able to like provide a better picture for people to actually um, engage with, right? I think that's the powerful thing about stories. I think that's the powerful thing about our narratives and our experiences is that the more that you add to the table, right, the bigger we make the table, like the more rich of, a, of an experience we have and it helps people find many different <laughs> entry points to come in. Um, it also has been challenging because I also think that, you know, because this movement did start very womb-centered, it started very mm -hmm. cisgendered, right? That is very real about the reproductive justice movement. I don't, I don't want every, you know, I say this in all the spaces that I can. It did start very cisgendered and it's a powerful framework, but you know, the, the, the queer and trans folks, like their voices weren't necessarily in the beginning phases of this, but what we've seen over the evolution of the movement is that more leadership of queer and trans folks have been coming in, mm -hmm. and so we've been able to see a shift in the way that we even talk about reproductive justice so that it used to just be the three tenets, right? The right to have a child, not have a child, and parent. And now this conversation about bodily autonomy, right, has been able to be centered in the conversation because of the leadership of queer and trans folks, but that didn't happen without challenge, right? Because, you know, um, it's about people under, having an understanding and people being willing to like journey with each other, mm -hmm. right? Cause language is a big thing, you know, and that, and when people don't get that right, like trauma comes into play because mm -hmm. folks are fighting so hard to be seen as who they are right. and to be understood as that. And so we did come into those challenges and those, and we hit up against that. But I think that the opportunity there is for both sides to actually um, find ways to grow with each other. And I think that that's just, that continues to strengthen us, right? Um, as a movement. So it, it was challenging because of how this movement started. The evolution was definitely started because of queer and trans leadership. And I think the opportunity is that the more, the more stories that we add to the table, the richer we make it and the more entry points we find for folks to get connected to the work. Thank you so much. Absolutely, yeah. We're going on this side. Okay, um, hello. Hi. Hi, thank you for what you shared. I'm Linda, I'm a wife and a mom. And so my oh. question is, what advice do you have for me to encourage youth mm. um, to advocate and just to trust with the healthcare system? I'm leaving this space mm -hmm. with encouragement from you mm -hmm. to share a little bit of my reproductive oppression. Yes. That's, I have a story. Yes. So I'm thinking about youth, mm -hmm. what advice to I need to tell them to trust the healthcare system. I don't know that I'm there yet. <laughs> mm. Well, I think that, you know, trust comes when people um, feel a connection to you, 
right? So just like you said that you feel empowered to kind of share your story, I think the more that young folks are able to hear our stories, right? Because sometimes we talk at young folks, right? Do this, do that, do what I say, I know it, right? But we don't tell them why we know it, right? We don't tell them why, you know, we, 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 we're, we're encouraging them to do X, Y, and Z, right? We miss the story, we miss the narrative, right? Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. I think that in order for us to get more young folks involved in this work, for them to be more connected to it, they have to know these stories. And they have to have a space created for them to share their stories and not to be shamed for their stories, right? Um, but that they have a safe space to actually share their stories as well. And I think that when we bridge that gap, right, then we'll see more, um, more of our young folks kind of stepping into this work more. And it's already happening. Like, I have to give love to the young folks who are already doing this work, but I think that the more that we break down that barrier, right, where folks that don't even, they, you know, and, and bring our personal stories in more, then we'll actually start to see more of that um, okay. support from young folks coming in. Okay. So I encourage you to tell your story and to create safe spaces for young folks to share theirs that's led by them, right, mm -hmm. so they can have their space to actually um, talk about how this work and how this world is impacting them too. Because young folks just want a space, they want right? A space. They just want their mm -hmm. space to be able to like speak and to grow and to do that without shame, right? And sometimes mm -hmm. they feel like, you know, folks who are a little bit older than them don't give them that space. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Oh, absolutely. Yes. Oh, and use pop culture, y'all. Let me tell you something. <laughs> don't just think that you're going to have a PowerPoint for young folks and they're going to come up in there. Because it's just <laughs> not going to happen, right? It's not gonna happen. But if you can bring in some love and hip hop, if you can bring in some mu movies, right? If you can bring, you gotta think outside the box, good folks, right? It's about shifting culture. And so we have to use all of our different mediums to be able to do that. And our reproductive justice trainings that we do all across the country now, let me tell y'all, we have used so much of you know, um, social media, so much of pop culture, but it has really helped to like bring more millennials, right, and young folks, into this conversation. Um, so I, 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 I'm just gonna say don't be opposed to that, right, too. And that requires us to get into what they watching, get into what they listening to. We are gonna have to listen to Cardi B, good folks. <laughs> you may not like it, but just at least know one song <laughs> to get into the conversation, you know what I'm saying? Just watch one episode of Love and Hip Hop, just one, right? And I promise you, you will make headway into getting with young folks, I promise you. Yes. <laughs> um, thank you for your presentation once yeah, again. Thank what was really the conversation? So my question is really, um, given the privileged role of men in America, what part do we play, if any, in reproductive justice, and how can we support this work or just not stand in the way of it? Yes. Thank you for the question. Come on, men. We need you. We don't need your toxic masculinity, right? We don't need that, but we need you, right? And I think this, this question is one that we, we at Sister Song are actually really like holding very, very central right now. We hired our first cisgendered black man at Sister Song. That's dope. Y'all give a round of applause for Oreo. He's dope, right? And we working with this brother, right? We are working with him like we taking him on a case by case basis. You know what I'm saying? Because you just, you can't just open the door wide. You know what I'm saying? You got to be real intentional about how we work with our brothers, and, but it's important. And so I think the way that we did that with him, just to even use him as an example, like he stepped into this work like on the humble, for real, but he stepped in saying, I just wanna support. And so he started to create relationships with us as an organization and like sitting in and learning, right? So it's gonna take men in particular, and men in general, black men in particular, like saying, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm, can I just come sit at the table? Right? I don't have to say nothing yet. I just want to sit at the table and allow that process to happen where trust is built, where um, education is real, you know what I'm saying? And, and that you all get that learning exchange for, the, for there to be that next step is like, okay, can you start to have some conversations with your brothers about this, right? And then it's like, you know, that, that, that walk happens. So now Oreo is creating our first curriculum around black men and reproductive justice. So it's gonna be a way for black men to start having this conversation with themselves, right? Um, because I think that is critical and key, is that don't be trying to, you know, roll up in our spaces saying I got some things to say, but it's like I got some things to learn, right? And then how can I start to, once I get it, how can I go free somebody else? And then I can start the movement in that way. So I think that's just kind of like the, yeah, the, the, the journey that we've taken as we've stepped into this conversation, hopefully that's helpful in you thinking about how to get more connected to the work. 
Is it? Okay, great. <laughs> they told me I don't have no more time, but I want to take one more question. Can I do that? I can take one more. Who is it? Okay, great. Hi, my name is Kristen. Um, I just want to thank you so much for your talk. I'm from rural North Carolina, too, so it means a lot to hear another black woman talking about, like, the issues that are really important to us. Mm -hmm. um, so my question is, well, you mentioned Black Panther. It kind of got me thinking about mm -hmm. Afrofuturism and everything. Yes. So I wanted to know if you had a personal vision for black women and women in color in general um, in terms of parenting, birthing, and bodily autonomy in the future. Yes, I want us to be able to do that in the ways that we want to. Like, I mean, so I love Black Panther, and, and I, I've been doing some thinking. I was like, there wasn't no pregnant women on there, though. <laughs> and, and I wonder if, you know, if any of those warrior women was on their period when they had to fight. Like, oh, these are all the things that came to mind for me, right? I was like, yo, how can I, like, do that and I'm on my period? I don't know. Um, <laughs> so I think... For me, um, when I think about the future for us and what I want to be, I, I want um, there to be more, I want us to see ourselves reflected in the system, right? I want there to be more black doctors. I want black midwives and doulas to be centered. I want us to be able to um, care for each other because we have, this is already in our, we already do this. We've been doing this since the beginning of time. And I just want that to be honored, right? That we actually know we've been controlling our own fertility. We've been delivering our own babies. We do this. Right. And I think that, you know, with the medical industrial complex and the way that that kind of broke in and like disjointed that, I actually just want to see a convergence of that come back together um, for us as black women and women of color in general, because all of our cultures have our ways in which we've always controlled our fertilities, our bodies and all of that. And I just want that to actually I want there to be a, um, I want the, the medical industrial complex to be less involved and for our cultural practices to actually be more um, uplifted and more centered in how we hold ourselves. That's just what's important to me. I want a midwife to deliver my baby. I don't want to be in a hospital bed. Right. You know what I'm saying? Right. You know what I'm saying? Hey, midwives! Hey, midwives! Yes! You know what I'm saying? I want to be squatting. You know what I'm saying? I want to be walking around with, you know, stuff. I, I want that. You know? I don't, I don't want to be in a hospital. But you know what I'm saying? But, and I understand that the needs for us to be able to have access to that in the times that we need that. And even when we need to interface, right, with that system, that they actually, um, they trust black women, yeah. right? They trust us, they trust women of color to make our own decisions and don't push things on us that we don't need or we don't want, but they allow us to have the experience that we want to have, right? So yeah. that's just some of my vision for that. I'm working real hard on that in all the ways I can with reproductive justice. And I don't want us to be shamed. The other thing I want to bring into the room, y'all, because we don't really talk about, when we talk about reproductive health, we talk about sexual and reproductive health. Okay, and so I don't want us to like move, like forget in this conversation when we talk about health in general, but that also requires us to have conversations around, you know, comprehensive sex education for us to understand our bodies, right? Um, for us to um, be able to understand pleasure and sex and all of these things are important to, our, to us. And I don't want people of color to have to feel um, shamed for wanting to have beautiful sexual lives, right, too, um, because that's, and, and we need to make sure that our healthcare system opens up and enough to be able to help us get that, too, and I can have a conversation with my doctor about, like, so I really want to have more orgasms, and so, you know, you know, how can I do that? I want those conversations to be able to be had, and for that, we don't feel like they have to be in separate spaces, right? So, some of my visions, some of my visions. Thank you. <laughs> Can we give one more round of applause for Monica? Yeah. Thank you all so, so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And we wanted oh, to give you don't a... Walk away. Don't oh. walk away. <laughs> we wanted to give you a small token of our appreciation oh, and gratitude so, so, for you coming. You. So thank you. Thank you so, so much. And it's pretty. <laughs> thank thank y'all so much again. Thank you, everybody. Thank, thank you. you. Um, really quickly, we also wanted to recognize Dr. John Hatch, who wasn't here earlier when we spoke about him, but one of the pioneers of the Minority Student Caucus, if you wanted to stand so we could applaud. <laughs> or wave.
Okay, so thank you everyone for coming um, to the beginning part of the conference. We have a really exciting day ahead of us. Um, please take time in between sessions to visit exhibitors tables, um, view the poster presentations that are located in Willow Lounge. Lunch will be held at 1230 um, in the dining room. And if you're unable to attend lunch, please return your ticket to the registration table. Um, join us back here at 1.30 for our second keynote um, and engage with us on social media. We have hashtags MHC2018, hashtag Reclaiming the Narrative, and hashtag We Are Storytellers. We're on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and we have a Snapchat filter, so please use that too. Um, we also have an Instagram, Instagram frame in the lobby, so utilize that too. And thank you. We hope you guys enjoy the conference. Oh, her phone, yeah.